Well, uh, good morning, Mike. It's great to meet you. Uh, thanks for joining our uh, podcast. Yeah, I'm same here. Glad to be here. It's exciting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. Um, maybe just to get us started, I- I'd love to uh, um, just give you a chance to give us a little bit of your uh, your background, uh, who you are and what you're up to. <laughs> Yeah, so nothing really exciting. You know, I'm uh, I'm kind of getting up there in, in age a little bit. Time get time gets away from us, that's for sure. But uh, been self employed going on close to twenty years. There's been a lot of different variants of what I've done. Mechanicing and excavation or equipment's always been my passion. It's taken me a little bit of a time to get where I want to be, but we fi- finally got there. Everybody in my family self employed. I was one of those rare kids in school that I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be self-employed. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just didn't know exactly how I was going to do, how I was going to do it or how I was going to get there. And I um, had some awesome mentors along the way. Uh, I did branch out and work out for some corporate entities and uh, I'm very thankful for that. You know, it was a good experience, kind of uh, learned some stuff from it and also confirmed that what I was going to do is what I wanted to do. And uh, I guess 2004, 2003, 2004, kind of took the leap and, and started off in the excavating business. And then 2008 kind of hit and somehow I ended up in the construction business. Uh, did that for a while, building some high-end custom homes. And then um, around 2018, I just kind of got back to basics and wanted to follow my passion and pretty much went back down the excavating route. And that's where, that's where I live at today. Very cool. Looking uh, looking forward to learning more uh, about this. Um, maybe before we get uh, too far, um, tell me about Bubba Dump. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of people listening will probably most likely know me from social media. Uh, YouTube is the biggest platform we're on. And uh, I don't think I'm completely um, – uh, unusual in naming equipment. You know, a lot of people name their equipment and different things. And uh, we've done that way before we were ever on social media. But uh, a while back, we started building a custom truck and it became named Lieutenant Dan. And <laughs> um, everybody always thought that was from Forrest Gump. It's Forrest Gump reference, right? And it, it kind of mm-hmm. actually has a little bit of a different meaning. The truck was an old Navy truck. Uh, I've been told several times that I've messed up the rank on this, something horrible. But we called the Lieutenant and uh, – you know, for its service. And then uh, my uh, father that ended up getting passed away or ended up getting killed in a tragic accident, his name was actually Dan. So I kind of attribute to him. We called it Lieutenant Dan. And uh, then we got another truck, which is an off-road articulated truck. And my wife was being funny one night, and she thought going with the uh, um, kind of the uh, Forrest Gump theme, she decided to call it Bubba Dump, and it stuck. So, (laughs) you know, whenever you name a piece of equipment like that, especially on uh, YouTube, it almost becomes like another character. It's another person, right? So it's kind of uh, of taken off and going, and and there's, you know, some of the stories about how stuff got named is a little bit of an insider stuff, but the guys that follow along close kind of know know what we're talking about. So it's, it's fun. It's cool. That's fun. Uh, sounds like you're going to have that truck forever. How, how do you uh, dispose of a truck with that name? <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it definitely makes it, uh, whenever you name something, it definitely becomes more part of the family. And there are several pieces of equipment we don't have names for, and they're the ones that kind of uh, come and go a little more often. But I catch a lot of grief on the channel for not having Lieutenant Dan done, but it's a, it's a hobby truck. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 I like right. building stuff. I like working on stuff. And unfortunately, other things take priority sometimes. So you just kind of got to do what you what you can when you got time. So we'll get to it one of these days. We'll get her finished up. Do you put like logos on it or anything like that? Is yeah, so the, the, uh, yeah. the A30C, uh, which is Bubba Dump, we uh, the yeah. grill was actually busted out of it. So yeah. uh, we made a custom grill that goes in it, and it's got uh, Bubba Dump on it. And then uh, we got some merchandise made up selling for some Bubba Dump. That's another opportunity it gets is, you know, you get to sell merchandise with different different names on stuff. But Oh, that is fun, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's a whole other whole other element to what we what we do. So people get invested in it, which I understand, and it, uh, these, these pieces become part of the, part of the, part of the family. Very cool. Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, also just before we get too uh, too far in here, um, 
it sounds like you're living like right on the edge of a time zone. Uh, curious <laughs> how that works. Uh, uh, 75% yeah. of the cities in EST and 25% in uh, CST. So yeah. we, uh, the, we live right on the central eastern time zone, which all the locals know it is fast time and slow time. There's an hour difference there. <laughs> um, for years and years and years, what, what makes it difficult for us is they keep changing the timeline. So, like, right. some years we won't change. Some years the counties to the east will change, and we won't. Sometimes the counties to the west will change, and we won't. And um, it's, um, it's a mess. So, to give you an example of how screwed up our area is, I can leave my house, drive west, and get back in the eastern time zone. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, our county is not actually the city. Our county on three sides is, is surrounded by Eastern time. On one side, it's still central time. Uh, we're like this little hub of a pocket here. So, you know, a lot of our jobs are in Eastern time where we run off central. Some of our employees come out of Eastern. We run off central. Uh, some of our suppliers are Eastern versus central. I know I'm not the only one that's unique to this. There's a lot of other people who live on timelines. And, of course, with the way we do commerce nowadays, we cross timelines all the time. But uh, sometimes just a simple thing is, you know, when to meet up for lunch. is It turns into an hour of somebody waiting right. on the other person. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've even threatened to create my own time, you know. But um, it's, 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 not, it's not panned out. It is... It is a pain in the butt, but we've dealt with it our whole life. So it's just something you kind of come accustomed to, you know, um, every time you confirm a meeting or you confirm a start time or, or anything like that, you always confirm, you know, slow time or fast time or Eastern or central. I love the slow time and fast time. That's got to be so <laughs> frustrating, like ordering materials for 7 a.m. Well, in some Eastern ways, in some ways from, you know, like yeah. we're on slow time, so we're central, right? So sometimes okay. your suppliers that are on fast time, you get an hour head start because they're, oh, they're, they're yeah, that's, for you. Yeah, um, yeah. Normally, I'm a glasses half full guy, and I totally went in the wrong direction there. Yeah, so there, there <laughs> yeah. is advantages to it. Now, the problem is when it's late in the day and you need something, they close an hour yeah. before you quit. So, you know, you catch, <laughs> right. <laughs> you catch, it, on, you catch it on both ends, but uh, – you know, yeah, to me, it's all about how many hours of daylight. Um, Eastern time, it stays later, longer into the day, which is yep. fast time. Yep. I'd much rather start with my lights and end at 5 or 6 o'clock uh, with the sun going down. In the dark. Where yeah. on, slow, on central time, slow time, you know, we start with the sun already up, and sometimes we finish it in the dark. Uh, that's yeah. where... That's where it makes the biggest difference to me is, is you know, starting and stopping time and... Um, they call it daylight savings time, and the argument I've always heard for years is they wanted the kids to get on the school bus in the daylight. Yeah. Um, but Eastern time, fast time, they get on there in pitch black, so that argument's out the window. So it's it, it comes down to our good old friends and politics is what it comes down to. <laughs> how, I can only imagine. How, do, how does it work with, like, log books, you know, um, for the number of hours you're working and – you know, especially with, uh, with the number so, of hours you're driving, that's got to be a little confusing. No, that's uh, that's actually um, that's actually a great um, great question. So, you now we had the construction industry. We had electronic time. Uh, as far as mm -hmm. trucking goes, uh, we truck within our air radius, so we don't deal with log books a whole lot. But what we did run okay. into problems is we had a program called About Time, to where all of our employees could clock in and out on their phones when they got to a job and different things. Right. Well, your phone's constantly switching time zones. Right. So it may, it may take an hour or give you an hour, and our time was all screwed up. And, and finally, we, oh. had, we just had to get everybody that was on the system to lock their phone to where it stayed in central time zone. Because you, you right. clocked in here, and then you drove to the eastern time zone. It, you may have worked eight hours, but it only clocked you at seven. Right. Because you lost yeah. the on the other way. And then the guys would get smart and they'd clock in on Eastern and drive to Central and gain an hour, you know. <laughs> so uh, it took us a little while to kind of figure out what was going on with that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the system, we haven't used the system in a few day, few years, but I'm sure they could figure out how to get that uh, to talk to each other. But back then, it was a couple of years ago, it was, a, it was a big deal. It was a big deal trying to keep time right. straight. Whenever you got employees crossing time zones and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, that's hilarious. It sounds like a logistical nightmare, but definitely kind of a fun. It's one. a whole <laughs> other element thrown into the ball game that don't. Yeah, you know, most people. Like I said, I know I'm not the only one unique living on a timeline, but 
uh, it, it does make it, um, I guess it's because it's so close to us and, and, you know, it, and like I said, we're stranded on three different sides of, I, I don't right. know of any other places you can, I can literally drive like 60 miles east and get back in the 60 miles west and get back in the Eastern time zone, which is insane. Most lines are pretty cut and dry, but yeah. we're just in this little bitty old pocket over here. No man's <laughs> land by ourselves. Oh, uh, that's funny. So, um, it, let's go back uh, to the beginning. So you, you're telling, you know, kind of how, how you got started. Maybe, maybe we can head all the way back there. How, how did you get into this? Has the passion uh, for construction always been there since you were a child? Yeah, it has. I mean, from um, my mom's side of the family grew up in the insurance business. They, they were big into the, the I guess you call it white collared world. Uh, my dad's side of the family, my dad in particular, he grew up in the coal mines, the construction equipment, all that stuff. That's where my interest was from day one. I love building stuff. I love tinkering. I love fabricating. I love, you know, uh, mechanics, uh, anything mechanical. I, w- I was there. Uh, but I also had a passion and a knack for operating equipment. So um, I went to college, uh, Lincoln Tech, got a two-year degree in applied science. Then I went to work for a Mac truck dealership for about three and a half, four years. And that was an awesome experience. I still talk to a lot of people there today. That's where I honestly consider I get my college training, went to, took advantage of all, everything they had to offer. I had some good people there I worked with. Interesting. Uh, come back and worked for a local contractor. And of all things, I traveled, traveled around the Midwest remodel McDonald's. You want to talk really? about learning how to be efficient. You yeah. study how McDonald's does business. Um, I know that sounds crazy, but I mean, if you weren't, we we would go into McDonald's, jackhammer out the floor, tear out the counter, rip down the menu boards, completely gut the drive through window, and you Mm -hmm. better have a plan to be selling sausage, egg, and cheese biscuits or whatever it is by 6 o'clock the next morning or you're going to jail. I mean, that's just just the way way McDonald's operates. So it teaches you how to really be methodical and think through stuff and have everything planned out. And the guy I worked for there also was, was a very good mentor, so... I did that for a few years, and, and, you know, the ultimate goal was always to get self-employed and uh, end up buying a, a small mini excavator and kind of start venturing out doing some stuff. Uh, the plan was to go 100% excavating because that's where I wanted to be, but uh, yeah. with the 2008 recession pending and, and, you know, having a new guy, there was a lot of competition in our area at the time. I kind of ended up going down the foundation route. I ended up uh, discovering this product called ICF. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, become, become really passionate about ICF. We actually won a couple international awards for some ICF homes we built. But I seen the benefits of building an entire home out of ICF. Most people were just using it for stem walls and basements. And I've seen the benefits of building an entire home. Whenever I say an entire home, going from the footers to the rafters, you know, yeah. support main level floors. And um, I couldn't get anybody on board to do this and then i couldn't get any other contractors to come in to finish these things out so next thing you know i'm i'm a gc i'm building houses now just because i want the icf works we go in and do the site prep with the driveway into the septic pour all the icf well nobody wanted to follow us so now we're hiring framers and everything else and that ended up taking <clears throat> that ended up taking us down the road of uh, building, we, we call them high-end, energy-efficient custom homes. Um, yep. We built well over 100 homes in a 10-year span. And um, what ended up happening, not to bore you too much, but I kept the excavating business. It continued to grow. The construction business got out of my control really quickly. And I ended up taking on a partner in the construction business. Yeah. Uh, so the excavating business and the construction business were kind of running parallel with each other. I was still full on either excavating business. Uh, the construction business was owned by me and another gentleman. And uh, we were off to the races, man. We were we only built ICF houses. We've become very well known for it. Um, won some awards for it. I'd like to think we were really good at what we did. Uh, we focused on uh, pushing the limit of diminishing returns and an energy efficient home. So basically our thing was, is we want to make this thing as energy efficient as possible, but whatever you do, whatever money you spend to make it more energy efficient, we want to make sure there's a return on that investment. Um, right. So many people get down the road of just, you know, spending money, 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 money to make it energy efficient, but some of this stuff never returns. 
So we were yeah. like, we were trying to be how practical can we be? And, and I don't know how if you're familiar with you are. We lived and died by the HERS score, uh, which the HERS okay. score is uh, basically, I call it the, the miles per gallon or the gas mileage reading on your home. Yep. Uh, so if you had a house that scored zero as a scale of one to 100, so if you had a house that scored zero, you used no energy off the grid. If you had a house that scored 100, um, you were 100% built to the current energy code. So if you had a house that scored 120, that basically means you're 20% less efficient than you should be. If you had a house that scored 80, you're 20% mm-hmm. more efficient than what the code was. And for probably about 10 or 15% more investment on the cost of the home, we could get a house down in the 60s. So you're, you're talking about being for a 20% investment, you're 40% more energy efficient. Wow. So the cost of living in that home out of your pocket is the same. The difference is you're paying it to a mortgage, which is an asset versus a utility company, which is a fluctuating debt expense. Sure. Um, so it took a lot of educating people to say, Hey, your cost, cause everybody wants to talk about the mortgage number or the purchase price, right? Yep. Which obviously what we we're doing would be about 15 to 20% more, but you're saving 40% on energy bills and you know, and you got a lot more sustainable asset as far as maintenance and everything goes. So, uh, it kind of took a little while for us to get people educated. Once we, you know how it is. Once you get one person sold, and they start yeah. bragging about how awesome their house is, then we're turning people away because it just went, it went, it went crazy. It was, it was wild. So, which side do you like better, the excavation or the the construction side? <sighs> There's no doubt, and that's where the the change of mindset kind of been. We were building high end homes, and we needed high end employees. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to discredit anybody that works for us because we had some awesome people that worked for us. We were still considered a small business. And uh, I we, we grew to the point where I wasn't on the job no more. I was out running around managing subs, managing people, doing all kinds of stuff that I didn't really want to do because I enjoy working with my hands and, and doing my thing. So at the time, we had the construction business. We had a real estate development business. And I still had the excavating business running. And I had two kids that were getting older. Uh, Josh and I ran this business we, for 10 years. It was 2008 to 2018, and um, we did good with it, but we never did as good as what we had hoped to do because it was just always a rat race of chasing your tail. He right. had some other opportunities. I was tired of not being the guy in the mud. I just didn't be the guy in the mud with the trench, with the shovel, and um, yeah. he had some other opportunities. I just finally made the decision, I'm going to stop chasing the dollar. I'm going to go back to doing what I enjoy. So we kind of... Uh, Closed down the construction business in 2008. I went full-time into excavating. That's also when I started my, my Dirt Perfect channel. Yep. And um, it's it's been great. You know, I I truly enjoy what I do. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I've learned that bigger is not always better. It's me and a couple part-time guys right now. And yep. um, we are... We are setting the world on fire. I mean, I, I hate to jinx this. We are doing, we are doing <laughs> good. So, uh, and I... I am back doing what I want to do. I am turning wrenches in the shop. I'm playing yep. in the mud. I'm sending equipment. Um, I'm not not managing people like I used to manage. Um, it gives me the freedom to, you know, go to Vegas and do these big expos. And I, I got some awesome sponsors I travel around and do some stuff with. So uh, kids are in travel ball and sports. So, you know, it gives me the flexibility to make a lot yes. more of those games and tournaments. And there's a lot more to life than the dollar. You know, and and I know I'm getting off subject here a little bit, but so many people in life chase status, and mm-hmm. that's the fastest way to be unhappy. You know what I mean? Like, if you want to be yeah. the trash man, you be the best damn trash man you can be and be proud of it. You know what I mean? It's, right. it's kind of where I don't get caught up in titles and, and this, that, and the other. I just uh, – I do what I love and I wouldn't change it for the world, and I don't really care what anybody else thinks. <laughs> I know that's probably a little crude, but – did you ever find, uh, I mean, so I <clears throat> I used to have a landscape uh, construction business and kind of similar space. And, you know, the first couple crews, you know, up until like three crews, man, we were making money. It was awesome. Really fun times. You know, money was coming in and, and everyone was happy. And then, you know, we ended up growing, you know, pretty big. We had like 400 people by the end. But there was a middle time where we were growing for the sake of growing and we were working harder than we ever could ever had. And 
we weren't making money. Like yeah, it, was, it was really difficult making that switch. No, I, I know. So what you just described is a very, very, very hard to explain, but I know exactly what you're talking about. And Josh, my business partner, I used to talk about, there's this no man's land. Like you can yeah. have yourself and 10 guys and you can make a killing from 10 yeah. guys to about 60 guys. It's the struggle bus. And then you cross another yeah. threshold to where yep. you're back rolling again. And, the, and if yep. you look at, if you look at the history of companies, there's very few that live in that middleman space. It's either like you're small and efficient yep. or you're big and you can pay for your mistakes. Um, yep. Is the best way I know to describe it. And we got, we ramped up our business two or three times and we just kept getting stuck in that middleman zone. And, you know, there was, there was times we built, um, I think 12 or 15 houses a year and our yep. revenue was through the roof, but our Very profit well. margin was trash. Yeah. Um, and then the last couple of years, we kind of went back to basics and we built like three or four houses a year. Revenue was way down. Profit margin was way through the roof. You got to be, the first thing you got to do is you got to be efficient what you do. And then it's easy just to keep adding people and equipment, but that don't mean you're scaling properly because the bigger you get, the more layers you get. You know what I mean? And and, and as much as we'd like to have our finger on the pulse of everything, it's impossible. So you got to have, um, you got to have procedures and stuff in place to kind of make decisions for you or let people know how you want those decisions to be made. And uh, it's tough. I mean, I, I've got people that live in the, the 100 employee plus space, and I got a lot of people who live, you know, down here in the 10 employee or less space. And, but that in between, man, it's, it's no man's yeah. land. It really is. Yeah. We found, uh, it, you know, it's definitely one of those hurdles that you don't expect. You're just, you're, you're clipping along and you're like, yeah, if we, why don't we add two more crews? We've got the business, you know, we, we could use it, maybe add a maintenance crew, get a third one, you know, onto the existing three or four. And then you, know, you need a whole layer of management. You've now got people estimating, you've got, you know, doing bids and estimating, you've got one or two managers out there and, you know, the vehicles and what you don't really realize is, as soon as you're personally off the job sites, even with management, the, the production kind of, you know, you lose a little bit of production. So you end up with so much dead expenses. Um, so like you said, you're off the job site, so you're no longer billable anymore, correct? Exactly. You, you put all these layers of management in there. They're no longer billable. They're a dead expense. Your production goes down because you're not present. So, Everything goes there. But what other people don't think about is, let's say I hired five framers. Well, if one frame and crew is waiting on the electrician to get done, the next frame and crew is waiting on weather, and the next guy is waiting on the foundation guy to get done, I got three frame and crews that are sitting there piddling for three or four days now that I'm paying to keep busy because I can't lose them, right? Versus if I subcontract out the framer, he only gets paid if he shows up. So... What we ended up learning, and I'm sure it's the same thing in the landscaping business, you're waiting for a supply to show up or you're waiting for this job to get done for that piece of equipment. There's so much inefficient use of time and it's so hard to manage because you're, whenever you got that many people, everybody's always waiting on something, which ends up being dead time, which ends up being a dead expense. Um, I know there's people who can argue with us all day long in the comments or, or however they want to about, well, but you know, it's less for this, it's less for that. And then there is, there is um, advantages to both ways, but what we found towards the end is having great relationship with subs was by far the most efficient way to run that. There's some stuff you got to do yourself, but know where your bread and butter is at. Our bread and butter was ICF work and excavation. So that's what we focused on hard. We made good relationships with subs on everything else instead of trying to do it all in house. And that was our most successful, our, our most successful go at it. But I got a question for you. How do you explain that to somebody? Because honestly, I tried to have it explained to me. I didn't understand it, <laughs> but I've lived it and I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. I'm not sure that I, I could do it justice and, you know, articulate it perfectly in the next, uh, you know, 30 seconds. But, um, you know, when you're, you're just talking about, you know, how you could save some money, I think you're talking about, uh, economies of scale. And, you know, to answer that, I think you, 
first of all, the answer to your question is a conversation probably, but right, the answer right. to that one specific comment, sure, there's economies of scale, but it's, you still have expenses. So, you know, a hundred thousand dollar trucks, say you can buy them for five, 5% cheaper now and they're $95,000. You still need two extra trucks that don't pay for themselves. You can't build them out. So that all comes it's right like off I, the bottom line. It's like I tell right? my wife, it's only a good deal if you need it. Yeah, exactly. But unfortunately, with too much growth, you do need it. And then you really got to grow to be able to start paying for it and get into that profitable zone again. Because uh, the overhead just becomes way, way, way too high. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm probably not articulating it well enough. But. No, it's 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 very difficult to do. I um, Very difficult to do. And and sometimes people just have to experience it. And if they come out the other end, they're going to be a lot better for it. But you know, one of the most common questions I always get asked is, you know, how do you get started in excavating business or how do you do anything? And my comment is always walk before walk before you run. You know, don't go yep. jump out and get into a whole bunch of debt and get in over your head right off the bat. And then yeah. uh, don't get too big for your britches. You know what I mean? Like stay in your space. Stay where you're comfortable. Stay where you're efficient. Stay where you're profitable. Know your, know your area. You know, it's so tempting to... It's so tempting to go out and say, you know, I got X, Y, and Z and look at me. And I just, that is not me. It's just not me. If you, you guys yeah. look at my equipment, it's it's old, but it's reliable. It's it's profitable. That's what it comes down to. Yeah. When I started, I thought it was, uh, you know, I was, I was buying great big Tonka trucks. You know, I was pretty excited about <laughs> owning all this stuff and real proud of it. And, you know, the further I got in, the more I realized, you know, I'm better to rent this stuff, you know, have somebody yeah. else maintain it, send it back after the job, just get the right machine. Um, it really doesn't matter. And and I also got, you know, into a little bit of a trap where you, um, I'm sure you've probably heard this before, where you start thinking that, you know, you're building all this equity, but the equity is in the machines. Other than what's happened in the last few years with the supply chain challenges, you can't really have your equity sitting in a depreciating asset, right? No, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've said for years, and it's not always right, you know, I'm cash poor, asset rich, but my business partner used to always say, you know, we'd have X, Y, we'd have a, an asset sitting on the shelf. He said, that's fine, but I can't go to the store and buy milk with it. What good is it to me? <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. that ash, the cash is the best asset, right? Because it's, it's liquid. You can do whatever you, whatever, whatever you want to with it whenever you need. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to have a bunch of assets – you can't have a bunch of debt to go with it. That's the, yep, that's the agreed. important part. That's the important part of that. You know, uh, yeah. everybody wants to talk about these million dollars worth of machines they own, but they don't tell you about the nine hundred ninety nine thousands they got borrowed on it. If you own a million dollars worth of machines, one point two million, right? Or they're upside <laughs> right. down on it. But right. if you own a million dollars worth of machines and you only owe a hundred thousand dollars on them, well, that's a little bit of a different. That gives you a lot more options. Mike, I want to ask you, um, it, I'm told you're a real uh, family man and that you, you get your, your family out cleaning the equipment and, and whatnot. Yeah. Is that true? So, yeah, we, uh, we, got, we got a fairly close-knit family. You know, mom's side, as I kind of mentioned, everybody on her side's self-employed and everybody's pretty strong-willed and strong head and everybody wants to do stuff. Like, I could have had a lot of businesses probably gave to me or inherited, but I decided to start my own. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the way everybody on that side of the family is, which... Uh, it's, we're close, but it's more of a competition close than it is like a family close. But my wife's side of the family is a complete opposite. They're thick as thieves and, you know, and all that stuff. But, uh, I, my kids, I got a, a boy that's eight and a daughter that's 12 and they, I will support them to do whatever they want to do, but mm -hmm. no matter what they do, they need to learn responsibility and work ethic. Right. And, um, that's, that's the main reason, you know, they, my shop's attached to my house. I come home a lot in the evenings. I'm working out here in the shop. They come out and piddle with me and spend time with me. I just built a science project for my daughter out here, um, which is stuff they want to do, and I'm glad they want to spend time out here. But sometimes, like washing equipment, that's stuff we got to do that has to be done. Nobody wants to do. And right. uh, before we get our iPad or whatever we're going to have for that evening, sometimes we've got to complete a few chores. But, <laughs> you know, it's funny because they always complain about it to start. But then once they get doing it, of course, I stay out there with them. I, I'm involved with them. Yeah. I don't just leave them. But uh, yeah. once they get started doing it, then it then it turns into a family event. You know what I mean? A family yeah. thing together. And, 
and uh, we end up having a good time with it. They're they're both getting to the age, especially my son, where he's last summer he went to several jobs with me. He's getting interested in the equipment, and he's he can run the truck and get stuff for us. He can he knows you know I've trained him enough to know how to be safe on the job side and where he can and can't be. And uh, looking forward to more of that with him this summer. My my daughter, she is just she is a natural operator. Like you can put her on a piece of equipment. She can, she understands that she can do it. You know, you know, she can just figure it out, but she don't show a whole lot of interest in it. So I've, we'll, we'll see, you know, times will change. She's only, only 12, but uh, I told her this summer, my, we got, we own a local convenience store here as well. And she goes and likes to work for grandma or Mimi, they call her because she can fold pizza boxes. And, and Mimi was very mean to me growing up, but she's very nice to my daughter. <laughs> I, I, I told mom the other day, I said, you're done with her. I said, it's my turn to toughen her up this summer. She's coming to work with me. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, I think it's, you know, they're busy kids. They're all involved in, involved in sports and, and their friends and everything else going on. But at some point you got to learn some responsibility too, you know, um, I worked for my grandma growing up and, and loved my grandma to death, but she was pretty stern. If you told her you're going to be there at seven o'clock to cut grass, you better be there at seven o'clock to cut grass or you're in trouble. <laughs> and, uh, but it taught me a what lot. What age was that? Oh was man. That 12 or no, I, I was, I'll probably get somebody in trouble with a child labor law, but I think I was going <laughs> to the cemetery like seven. <laughs> right. uh, but, uh, but yeah. I, I think they need to, learn all aspects of life and it just makes them better prepared. And I think it'll also help them make a decision about where they want to go in life when that time comes. Uh, yeah. How many people nowadays don't even think about what they want to do until they're in high school? You know, they have right. no, yeah. no thought process um, whatsoever. So um, I'm not a slave driver. I don't force them to do anything, but there, um, there is, I get them involved as much as I can. And honestly, most of the times, once I get them off the couch and get them out here, they're, they're more willing to participate. And, um, and I know for a fact they're learning stuff because they don't tell you that, but then they tell their other friends and this, that, and other, and you hear stories and, and, uh, it's, 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 it's being retained up there one way or another, whether they want to, want to admit it or not. So. One thing I guarantee you there, you know, whether it's learn to cut grass or, you know, operate that equipment, the real thing they're learning is work ethic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're, they're working in the evenings uh, and weekends you. with yourself and watching you work. Uh, that's and pride of ownership, all those intangibles. We could do a whole podcast on what happened to that work ethic. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a rabbit hole. Yeah, that's a rabbit hole. We'll, we'll avoid yeah. that. But, but um, and, and work ethic goes along with being responsible. If you say you're going to do something, do it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like hold yourself accountable to that, and that goes that goes a long way. So, um, you know, my wife gets a little aggravated at me sometimes. The only time I ever spend time with the kids is when we're working, which is not true. But we do spend quality time together while we're accomplishing tasks, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. For sure, I used to love helping my dad. You know, work yeah. in the garden, cut the grass cut trees down, you know, pulling brush up into the fire pile. I used to absolutely love that stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. right? Um, hey, I've got a note here to ask you about uh, this uh, custom dirt bike track that you, you built and watering hole <laughs> on a 900-acre property. So, well, I live in a small town of Derby. My family actually owns uh, 500 acres here that I, that I built on. And uh, lucky enough, I moved up here and buried the neighbor. And the neighbor has 40 acres that uh, adjoin us. And uh, they had a, I don't know, 15, 20 acre pasture. And uh, through my father-in-law having some health issues and stuff, they had to get rid of the uh, cattle and the pasture grew up. And um, I got this wild hair at my wild hair at my butt one day that we we're going to go build a go-kart track. It's actually a go-kart track we built. And I, I live on a hillside, you know, so I have all of our flat, flat ground on our farm is used for farming. We had this pasture just right next door that was all grown up. So I asked my father-in-law if I could build a go-kart track up there. He said, uh, yeah, if you build a watering hole for the kids to go swimming in. Well, I need water for the track anyway. <laughs> so in the excavating business, that wasn't too big a deal. So, I, man, we've had that for probably 12 years now. Um, ended up uh, building a nice lake up there. I tore down a water slide at our local pool and ended up installing the water slide up there. So the kids got that. Oh, cool. 
And uh, then we uh, build about, it's about a 16th mile go-kart track, and we, we don't have any sanctioned races. It's just kind of run what you brung, race for fun. But we've done that for um, several years now. We usually have 10 or 12 carts come out. We race one Saturday a month. And then, uh, of course, my son's getting old enough now. He's getting into the racing pretty good. But um, we do build, uh, I volunteer a lot of time for the local 4-H. We build a motocross track for the fair every year, volunteer all of our equipment okay. and time to do that. And uh, I've done that for several years. You got to get back, right? You know, uh, yep. one way or another. So, uh, luckily, our fair has become very well known for having the best fair track around. Uh, part of it has to do with uh, the, the geography of where the where the fairgrounds lays. We got a lot of hills and natural stuff to work with, but. I also haul two 850 John Deere dozers in to push dirt around and move, put, build this track. So we move a lot of dirt in a short period of time. So we're, we don't have bunny humps, bunny jumps. We have real, right. real jumps. So, but uh, it, it's worked. It's worked out pretty good. Does the track? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, does the track not stay there um, after the fair, like for the rest of the year? No. So that's what's uh, that's what's crazy about the fair. Uh, I've got some videos posted on this, but we'll show up on thursday we'll have to have the track built for friday and then we have the, the racing they'll probably get over with by midnight on friday night we have to have the arena back flat for a horse show at seven in the morning and then they have tractor pulls there that afternoon no way oh so wow. we, we probably move seven or eight thousand yards of dirt and a couple <laughs> hours just i mean just getting with it so yeah, uh, I mean that's as exciting as the uh, the show itself. <laughs> yeah, there, there's there's people that stay around just to just to watch us just to watch us move it there. But uh, a good friend of mine and, and one of my better customers or my biggest customer, he's president of the fairgrounds up there, and um, he's doing a lot of good things to get on there. My kids are in 4-H. Um, uh, you know, that's one thing my family's instilled in me over the years. We're involved in a lot of different community projects. We've done over a million dollars worth of improvements to our local town here on a riverfront community center, uh, 4-H fair up there. So I'm, I'm happy to do it. If I'm, I'm willing and able and I enjoy it, I see everybody else enjoying it, and um, I, I have no no issues. It, you know, it, it's three days out of my year is what it comes down to. Right. Um, it, you know, and that's a small price to pay for what everybody gets out of it. Yeah, for sure. Sounds like everyone gets a lot out of it. Oh no, yeah, it's uh, it's a good time. A couple more quick questions. How did you get into YouTubing? <laughs> That's a great question. So, um, my neighbor, uh, which on YouTube is Logger Wade, uh, I've known Wade my whole life, way before any of us were doing social media. I think he started on YouTube maybe back in two thousand seven or eight, maybe a little after that. He's been on there for a while, but. Um, in 2017, he signed a deal with History Channel to be on Axeman. Okay. And he, he, he has been pursuing me to do YouTube for a long time. So he's had some success with it. And I just didn't have time for it. You know, with the construction business and everything else we had going on, I had no time for it. So we shut down the real estate development business. We shut down the construction business. And all I was doing was excavating, right? I thought, well, I got free time now. I got to have something to do with it. And Wade was going to be on TV. So... If I'm going to do YouTube, now's my best chance to give it a try. So I told my wife, I said, I'm going to do it for one year. At the end of one year, if I don't like it, if I don't enjoy it, then I'm done. And I wasn't really doing it to make money. That was never my intentions, but I needed to make enough money to justify my time. Like if I could just break even yep. on it, I was going to be happy. Uh, which I think, not to get off subject here, but that's one a lot of people want to get into social media and they, and they do it for two weeks and they have no success and they quit, right? I think right. if you're going to do it, you really need to do it for a year to give yourself a full opportunity to see what's going to happen. So uh, I guess it was November 17th of 2017, I posted my first video. And uh, my goal was the first year to have 1K, 4K, 1,000 subscribers, 4,000 watch hours is what you have to have to be monetized. I thought, well, if I got that by the end of one year and I'm making mm -hmm. a little bit of money, I'll keep going. If not, I got the option to quit. I didn't tell Wade I was doing it. I didn't tell nobody I was doing it. I just wanted to do it on my own just to, because yep. I know Wade would have gave me a shout out and gave me a jump start. And then if I quit, what, what good's that do? So Great. Um, I think by March I had like 5,000 subscribers and I don't know, close to a million watch hours. Like it just, 
<laughs> I have no idea why. It just took <laughs> off. And it's been a wild ride ever since. But um, it's been a good ride, man. It's gave me a lot of good opportunities. And one thing YouTube does very well is it aligns like-minded people. So it yep. knows your interest. It knows what you like. Uh, and it kind of connects you guys. And, and some of my best friends today have come from YouTube. Um, the opportunities I got are just unbelievable. I mean, yeah. I can't complain. Obviously, I make enough money to keep going. Um, right. I make enough money. I had to be honest that it, it would. I don't have to excavate. But I'm not. Wow. Falling back, I know I'm not falling back into that trap. You know, I need to excavate for content, and that's what I enjoy doing. Uh, right. So I, I'm very, very. Um, very, very stern on keeping YouTube a hobby, not the job. And yeah. I think that comes across on the channel that, that you're doing it for fun. You know, you're passionate about it. You're not making anything up. We don't push a lot of product. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we, we do our job. We just, we like, it's true reality TV. It's it's what we are doing that day. We don't butter it up. We're not actors. We don't take two or three takes at something. We just video yep. what we're doing that day. And it, here it is, you know, I, even talking with Wade and Axman and Bobby Gitson and a lot of these other guys on these TV shows, you know, stuff. I know what Axman filmed because I was there and I know what was put on TV and it's, they just took the footage and made their own story. You know what right, I mean? Like right. two totally different things. Uh, where here I can tell my own story. I have full control over that. And then I can interact with people that are involved that are watching to have interest and, uh, I think the best thing that ever happened to us guys on YouTube is is your reality TV turned into drama TV, and uh, right. it really really gave us a chance to uh, chance to shine. I'm also in a very unique space on YouTube. You know, you got all kinds of farmers, all kinds of generational guys coming into multi million dollar yeah. operations that got a camera and do good with it. Uh, and the landscaping industry is very tough because the, the the entry fee into landscaping can be very very minimal. I mean, you can mm -hmm. you can start a landscaping business on hundred thousand dollars or less. Um, nice. For sure. Yeah, and then you know you get the uh, the tractor, the compact tractor arena it gets very crowded. Mm -hmm. uh, but in my space, um, you know, it's it's about a million dollars to play, and then a mm -hmm. lot of people don't either have the time to mess with it or don't want their stuff videoed. Right. So um, my competition in my space on YouTube is is less, which I'm sure has definitely helped my growth uh, just because there's less channels out there doing what I do. That's super interesting, Mike. Um, <clears throat> we always ask people uh, what their favorite piece of equipment is. Um, do you have a favorite piece? So I, I'm going to give you two for two different reasons. So my very first piece of equipment that I – I ever really went into business with was an old 655 John Deere lawn tractor. Oh, yeah. uh, it was a 16 horse, um, just little diesel tractor, but it had a class one three point hitch on it. My grandparents actually bought it whenever I was about 12. And man, I've made a fortune with that thing, plowing snow and grading driveways. And that little tractor has taught me so much about business. It was ridiculous, you know, just kind of, and I'm right. very fortunate. I had the opportunity to have access to this thing. And I still have that tractor today. I actually used it today. Like, it is still part of the fleet. and still gets used on a regular basis all these years later. Nice. Uh, so that piece of that, – that particular tractor is always going to have a sentimental place in my heart just because, you know, it was, it was technically the first even though I didn't buy it. But uh, today with the modern equipment I got, it is no doubt it's my 120 John Deere excavator. Uh, it was my first big purchase uh, yep. back in the day, bought it off eBay sight unseen, which was a huge, huge gamble whenever, you know, I barely have enough mm -hmm. money to pay the wire fee, more or less the actual cost of the machine. But, um, that thing has been an absolute rock star. It's been a star piece of equipment. Um, I mean, I, it's just a pleasure to run. It's an older piece of equipment, but it's just like putting on, on no glove. You know what I mean? Like you, you get in there, you know what you can expect out of it. I got like 15,000 hours on this thing and, I've traded wow. off a lot of new pieces of equipment and kept this one because I've got I got brand new machines and if somebody told me I had to go out in this this field and dig a hole or my life or or else my life depended on it I guarantee you I'd take that one twenty out there and dig that hole like that's that's right. my that's my baby but that's that's my two man those those two pieces there definitely got a special place I'm, I mean I'm up to close to thirty pieces of equipment now so 
Uh, those two there are definitely the, the ones. Love it. Um, I love the story behind uh, the why on, on both of those. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Um, so, yeah, Mike, I mean, this has been awesome. Thanks for thanks for joining us. I've really uh, had a pleasure chatting. Um, how, how can our listeners uh, uh, find you? So we have uh, my main platform is YouTube, which would be Dirt Perfect. You can also find me on uh, uh, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook, all as Dirt Perfect. And then uh, we actually got our own podcast channel as well called A Few Points on Perfect. And we just did a complete podcast on that channel about rent versus leasing versus owning. Oh, nice. On, on equipment. So, uh, but uh, yeah, search Dirt Perfect on pretty much any platform and we'll probably pop up, good or bad, <laughs> one or the other. <laughs> but uh, we'll also be in, in Vegas for all the Con Expo activities coming up. So, definitely, definitely looking forward to seeing everybody and appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Maybe we'll uh, see you in Vegas at the uh, Con Expo. Yeah, this has been great. Thanks again, Mike. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you.